Last time in the Gospel of John, we got through part of uh, the, the third chapter, a very famous chapter because it contains the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. We actually got through about a third of it, but probably the thickest and slowest part. It may be that we can complete the chapter tonight, and we shall see. In the first 12 verses at least, we found this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus, Nicodemus the ruler of the Jews, coming out of curiosity, probably representing a group, perhaps a, a minority within the Sanhedrin, of which he was a member, who had noticed Jesus doing these miracles. We do not actually have record of any of the miracles that they saw. In fact, John has not recorded any miracles of Jesus up to this point, except for the turning of water into wine. And then the next thing, and but that wasn't in Jerusalem, where Nicodemus lived. He had not seen that. But Jesus had gone to Jerusalem for the feast of Passover, a week-long feast. And apparently at the beginning of that feast, he had cleansed the temple with a whip. And he had been challenged by the <clears throat> rulers of the Jews to show them a sign that he had the authority to go and clean the house as he did in the temple. And he said, well, you want to sign, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up again. They mocked him, uh, of course, because they thought he was talking about the ordinary <coughs> temple. They did not take him up on it. They didn't set to demolish the temple to see if he could raise it again in three days, and it's probably a good thing, because he didn't intend that to be understood that way. He intended it to be understood, or he intended it not to be understood, in most most uh, likely, that he was speaking about his body and that they would eventually destroy his body, but not permanently. He would raise it up in three days. So in the very earliest reference recorded to uh, Jesus to his death and resurrection in chapter 2, but he continued at that time, the same week that he had cleansed the temple, he no doubt continued the whole festival week, and there were signs and wonders that he did in the midst of the Jews there in Jerusalem, but none of them are recorded. We only have at the end of chapter 2 the statement that, uh, in, in verse 23, that many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he did. Those signs are unrecorded. And then Nicodemus came and said, we know that you are a teacher sent from God because no one could do these signs that you do unless God was with him. So this we know apparently represents Nicodemus and some others probably of his own class, no doubt speculating among themselves whether Jesus might be the Messiah. He obviously was claiming to be something special, that he could drive people out of the temple, a public access facility, and claim it was his house or his father's house. That was making a strange kind of a claim that no one had made before. And then, of course, doing miracles. So Nicodemus and others were beginning to wonder, is this the Messiah? We, we are told that he was wondering that. He didn't actually ask the question, but certainly that was what was on his mind. The Messiah would come and establish the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus comes and he begins the conversation with simply formalities, with uh, niceties. Uh, good teacher, we know you come from God because uh, the signs you do prove that to us. And Jesus just cut right to the chase and said, listen, if you're not born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. Now, Nicodemus had not mentioned, but no doubt was, it was foremost in his mind, is the kingdom about to appear? And Jesus, just knowing what his real concerns were before he expressed them, said, you can't see it unless you're born again. And the man said, well, I don't understand. Obviously, uh, you don't expect a man to go into his mother's womb a second time and be born a second time like that, do you? And Jesus said, no, uh, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. You have to be born of the Spirit. And the man said, well, how can these things be? And Jesus said, well, are you a, the teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? And then he talked about the wind. How that the wind is, uh, it defies human analysis. You don't know where it comes from. You don't know where it goes. It's invisible. You can't even see it. Of course, it does leave its uh, evidence of its presence upon the visible world. But he said, that's how it is. With this business of being born of the Spirit, it's a spiritual thing. It's going to be mystifying to you, no doubt. But he said in verse 
uh, 11, most assuredly I say to you, we, and he, by this he probably means himself and John the Baptist, we speak what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And by this strange statement, he apparently meant that if he has been speaking about things for which earthly analogies can be framed, birth, wind, things that are things commonplace things of the earth, familiar things. If, you, if I can't make you understand spiritual things by the use of earthly analogies, what in the world are we going to do when we get to the time to talk about things for which no earthly analogy can be imagined, can be presented? Uh, we're, we're, getting, we're not getting off to a very good start here, he's saying. And then in verse 12, uh, for 13, he says, No one has ascended to heaven. But he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man, who is in heaven. And this is where we left off last time. And I mentioned that that last line, who is in heaven, it's probably omitted from tra some translations because it's, it's absent from some manuscripts. In fact, the very oldest manuscripts lack it, but there's very strong manuscript evidence for it otherwise. And so scholars do not know if this last line, who is in heaven, belongs there or not, whether John really wrote that or not. But the problem with it, of course, is that Jesus is seemingly the one speaking. And if Jesus is speaking about the Son of Man and says, who is in heaven? Well, Jesus it was not in heaven at that time. He had come down. He had descended. He was not in heaven when he was speaking. Now, he was at the time the book was written. And so some have thought that this statement, the Son of Man, who is in heaven, is a comment by the author. You know, writing after the fact, after the conversation, he's making his own little comment there. The Son of Man, of course, is back in heaven again. He came down, but he's now back up there. In any case, the, uh, the insertion of this clause, who is in heaven, when you have manuscripts that contain it and manuscripts that don't, you have to decide which one is original. And when you think about it this way, if it wasn't there originally, why would someone put it there? It doesn't really, it, it only creates a problem. And yet, if it was there, we could see some ways they might omit it, thinking it's a mistake, because it's awkward. Usually when there's a difference in the manuscripts, and one reading is rather awkward and the other is not awkward, you can usually consider that the more awkward phrase is original, and that somebody has removed the difficulty in a later manuscript. Hmm. Rather than the, 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 the earlier manuscripts didn't have a problem and someone put it in there. Why would they do that? So it's probable that this line was there originally, but it may not have been Jesus speaking. Because what we find in this chapter and in much of John is that John is not really writing the same kind of gospel the other writers of the Gospels wrote. They are simply interested in telling the story. John is wanting to analyze and interpret the story. I mean, he began his gospel differently than the others. The others just begin with the facts of Jesus' ministry or his life or his birth. But John begins with an interpretation of it. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was with God. And he was the light of men and so forth. And so John is interested not in just giving a bare facts kind of account of the life of Jesus. That had already been done by the time he wrote this. That had been done three times at least by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John wanted to give a life of Jesus that was interpreted. And he wanted to give his own analysis and interpretation of the life of Christ illustrated by examples of actual events and things Jesus said. And so we find insertions from time to time of John's own commentary after he's reported something that was said. Now, in modern translations of the Bible, there are quotation marks where translators think they belong. But no one knows for sure in some cases where the quotes close because there are no quotation marks or, or punctuation marks in the Greek manuscript. So when you look in your Bible, uh, unless you're reading the King James, which wouldn't have any quotation marks anywhere in it, all the modern translations will have quotation marks. And in the case of the New King James, which I'm reading, the, the monologue of Christ is treated as if it goes all the way through verse 21. That's where you finally find the closed quote at the end of verse 21. 
You'll find the same to be true in the punctuation of the New American Standard and the ESV, all reputable modern versions. But I think it's a mistake. I don't think Jesus is talking that long. I think it's very possible that you should have a closed quote after verse 12 and a parenthesis with John giving his own commentary in verse 13. That would explain why 13 ends with the statement, the Son of Man who is in heaven. John is reflecting back on the fact that Jesus now has gone back to heaven. That's where Jesus is now. However, I believe at verse 14 and 15 we have Jesus speaking again. Now this is a little artificial of me because, like I said, we don't know where the quotation marks really belong. And uh, I, I'm going mostly by, frankly, intuitions about this, which are, you know, notoriously inexact and, and, and you know, unauthoritative. But having looked at this a great deal over the years, I'm thinking that Jesus is saying things, then John is saying things about what Jesus said, then Jesus is saying something, then John says something more about it. And uh, you don't have to see it that way. You can go with the translations that have the close quote at the end of 21. Actually, the Revised Standard closes the quote at the end of verse 15, which is another reasonable place to close it. But, of course, that leaves verse 13 within the statement of Jesus and maybe just favoring the readings that don't have that last line of who is in heaven there. That who is in heaven is a bit of a, a bugaboo. It's a little, first of all, it's not known for sure if it was in the original. And if it is, it... it uh, it certainly raises questions about whether that's Jesus speaking that line or not. Probably could not be. But I believe Jesus is speaking again. Uh, John resumes the quotation in verse 14 and 15. And I'm going to agree with the Revised Standard in closing the quote after 15. I believe that, I believe 14 and 15 are also what Jesus is speaking. Then John gives his commentary again. In 14 it says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now this is sp speaking about something that must happen apparently in the future from the standpoint of the speaker. So this must be Jesus speaking to Nicodemus rather than John writing afterward. We are now not reading John's comments, but Jesus continuing discussion. And he says the Son of Man must be in the, at some point in the future. Lift it up, and he's referring to the, to the crucifixion, of course. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now, lift it up is a, a term that is used uh, in the Gospel of John. As I said, it is a, a reference to him uh, being crucified. And he says it's just like when Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. That's the same way that the Son of Man must be lifted up. Now the serpent in the wilderness, of course, was not a living serpent. This is a bronze serpent. This is alluding to the story back in Numbers chapter 21. Israel was grumbling against God again, and God sent fiery serpents, venomous serpents among them, who bit them, and many of them were dying. Uh, perhaps all of them were bitten. Some died and others were dying. And Moses pled with the Lord for them. And God said, well, you make a, a serpent out of bronze. And you put it up on a pole. Interestingly, the word that is used for pole in the Hebrew text is the word for a banner pole. Now, that's the reason that's significant is a banner pole is a cross. Uh, it's got a, it's got a, a, a vertical and it's got a horizontal beam from which banners are hung on either side of the vertical uh, pole. So, and, and if it wasn't so, how would they keep the snake from falling down? Anyway, they, the thing had a cross beam. And therefore, they, they made an image of a bronze serpent and put it on the pole. And God said, whoever has been bitten by one of these serpents, if they simply will look at this bronze snake, they will be healed. And so it was. It so happened. And this is the image that Jesus gives similar to himself being raised up on a cross. So whoever believes in him, so believing in him for the, in the case of believing in Jesus is the corresponding part to looking at the serpent. It's not works. 
It's not earning anything. You don't earn anything by believing any more than people earn something by looking at something. It's not labor. It's not works. It's not law. It's strictly a matter of being willing to turn your gaze that way and not rebelling against it. I don't know if there are any Israelites in most day who just refuse. So I'm not going to look there. Uh, why would they? Why wouldn't they look there? Well, some of them just want to be rebellious, I suppose. But all it took was to not be rebellious. Just to look the direction that they're supposed to look and they'd be healed. They would have life given to them instead of the death that they were dying. And so Jesus says essentially that his own death is going to be uh, play a role for mankind analogous to that of the serpent on the pole. Now, Christians sometimes are a bit bothered by the fact that uh, that in the Old Testament, which would here represent Jesus on the cross, would be a serpent on a pole. And one would think that a serpent would be an image of Satan, not of Jesus. Why didn't he say put a lamb upon a pole or something else that might be a suitable uh, image of Christ since this was uh, intended to be a foreshadowing of Christ on the cross. And there's no obvious answer that can be given with the exception of maybe a couple of possibilities. One is that when Jesus died, he seemed to be defeated to the eyes of man, but really who was defeated on the cross was Satan. It was really Satan that was uh, ended up crucified, so to speak. Not literally. Jesus was when crucified, but he defeated Satan. Uh, he destroyed him who had the power of death. That is the devil, it says in Hebrews 2.14. It says that through death, Jesus destroyed him who had the power of death. That is the devil. Jesus wasn't destroyed on the cross, as would normally be the case of a man crucified, but he, he was victorious. It was the devil that was destroyed there. In Colossians 2.15, Paul says that Christ disarmed the principalities and powers and made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in the cross. When Jesus was anticipating his death in John 12, 31, he said, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And in, in John 16, when he's talking to his disciples how the Holy Spirit will convict the world, of judgment, he says, because the prince of this world is judged. The prince of this world was judged at the cross. The prince of the world was cast out at the cross. The principalities and powers were disarmed, and Satan was triumphed over at the cross. He that had the power of death, that is the devil, was destroyed through the death of Jesus. The death of Jesus conquered the devil. So to the eyes of man, it's like Jesus was hanging defeated on the cross. But really, from the divine standpoint, Satan was hanging there defeated on the cross, so to speak. Not because Jesus was Satan, but just because that's the upshot of what Jesus accomplished, you see. Now, there's, that's one possible reason why God would have chosen a serpent in Numbers 21 to be a representative of what Jesus would later be likened to. Another possibility is this, that the Bible says that Jesus, though he knew no sin, he became sin. For us, he became serpent-like in terms of God dealing with him. God had to deal with him as if he was evil itself. Not that he was, not that he ever done anything evil, but it's, it's uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In the Old Testament, the lamb that was sacrificed received the laying on of hands beforehand. The laying on of hands signified that the sins of the sinner were being transferred to an innocent victim, the lamb. Then the lamb was treated as if it was the sinner. It was put to death. The wages of sin is death. The lamb was then slain. It's as if all the wickedness from the wicked person was transferred to this innocent lamb. And now the lamb was treated as if it was the wicked one. And in Isaiah 53 and verse 6, it says, All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. That 
Jesus had all of our iniquities laid upon him. It became his burden to bear. It became his uh, wrath. He had to take the wrath as if he was the crook. In 1 Peter chapter 2, it says in verse 24, 1 Peter 2, 24, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. So Jesus bore on his own, in his own body our sins on the tree. Therefore, it was like when it's as if hands had been laid upon him by everyone in the whole world. And he was the spotless lamb, and all the sin of the whole world was transferred to him, and he became the sinner who was punished in our place. And so on the cross, though he was 100% innocent of any wrongdoing, he took the role of the wicked one who was receiving the penalty for all the wickedness. It's almost like he who was the lamb became in the reckoning of God and in the dealings of God the serpent, the foul thing that had to be destroyed, that had to be killed. Uh, and that may be one reason why the bronze animal on the pole had to be a serpent too to represent Christ. Strange as it is to our thoughts, there's a mystery and there's an, uh, an irony in it that, that Christ was perfect and yet he had to be treated as if he was as wicked as anything has ever been, as wicked as the devil himself. So whether it was because on the cross Jesus really conquered Satan rather than Jesus being the one conquered, and therefore the serpent is represented as hanging on there as the victim of this, uh, of this transaction, or whether it's because Jesus himself is seen as serpent-like after all the sins of humanity are placed upon him and he is then reckoned to be guilty of all that. I don't know, but these are some possible explanations of what's really kind of a gnarly problem. And that is why would Jesus choose a serpent to compare himself to, or more properly, why did God, back in the days of Moses, choose a serpent to represent what would eventually be an illustration of Jesus on the cross? But the suggestions I've made may, may uh, go some of the distance in trying to uh, give some kind of satisfactory answer to that, perhaps. So, he said, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, verse 14, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Um, I guess some manuscripts leave out the term shall not perish. And uh, yet it, of course, is found in verse 16 also, which I consider to be John's own gloss on what Jesus has said. I see him picking up the language of Jesus' last statement, verse 15, and making his own summary of the gospel based upon it in the famous verse, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The last clause being exactly like the last clause of verse 15. Which, I mean, it's again, it's my own intuition. I could be wrong, but I think Jesus is speaking up through verse 15, verses 14 and 15, and then John, picking, taking his cue from what Jesus said there at the end of verse 15, makes his own summary of the gospel in, in uh, verse 16. And one reason is because we find in verse 16 the word God. Whereas Jesus would more commonly refer to God as the Father. If Jesus was speaking, you might expect you to say, The Father so loved the world. Because that's how Jesus almost always spoke about God as the Father. To speak of God seems just a little more detached. Not that Jesus never used the term God. He did sometimes. So it was very much less his preference than Father. And so, in using the word God, it seems more like a, a theological pronouncement, whereas when Jesus spoke about the Father, it was more of a relational kind of thing rather than a theological thing that he seemed to exhibit in, in speaking to the, of the Father in that intimate way. Now, a few things here, just related to certain theological controversies. I've been involved in so many theological controversies over the years that I, I can't look at any text that I know to be a proof text for one or another side of the controversy without bringing it up here, partly because I, I don't just want to talk to you about the, the, the material, but I want to also, if possible, equip you somewhat for 
uh, controversial, uh, you know, application of the of the material in certain controversies that you may encounter. One of those controversies, of course, is that of of Calvinism, and in particular, the question of whether a person is born again as a result of believing, or whether they believe as a result of being born again. Now, you may never have heard it put this way, but it's it's almost the quintessential summary of the difference between Calvinism and other forms of Christian theology. Other forms of Christian theology say that you must repent and believe, and then, as a result of repenting and believing, you are born again. And what that means, you pass from death unto life. You were dead in trespasses of sins, but now you come to life because you have believed in Christ. Calvinism says, no, because you are dead in trespasses of sins prior to your conversion, a person who is dead cannot believe and cannot repent, and therefore, God must make you alive first. And then you can believe. So, to the Calvinist, regeneration, which means coming alive from the dead, being born again, is what we're talking about here. To the Calvinist, regeneration precedes faith. To all other forms of theology, including those which predate Calvinism by hundreds of years, Faith precedes regeneration. In fact, in fact, uh, faith allows for regeneration. Whereas to the Calvinist, regeneration allows for faith. Because to the Calvinist, if you are not born again, you are dead in the sense that you can't do anything. In sense, uh, you can't repent, you can't believe, you can't make any motions of God toward God, you can't even seek God. That's, that's what total depravity means in Calvinism. And that's why they come up with unconditional election, the second point. Total depravity is the first point. Unconditional election means God has to elect to save some people. But he can't do it on the basis of anything they'll do because they're dead. They can't do anything. So he's got to just unilaterally choose to bring some of these people to life so they can believe. And since he doesn't do that for everyone, he makes a choice who he will and who he will not do that for. And he doesn't do it based on anything he sees in them because there's nothing to see in them. They're dead. And so it's unconditional. And so this idea that re regeneration has to precede faith is, is, uh, is essential at the core of the Calvinist concept. Whereas non-Calvinistic theology teaches that anyone might believe or repent. And if they did, then they would have life. They'd be regenerated as a result of believing and repenting. Now, I've tried to make that all clear so that you can see, as we read John or any other passage in the Bible on the subject of being born again or coming to life or regeneration, having eternal life given to you when you were dead before, all the passages in the Bible indicate that it is as a result of believing that you're born again. And this is one of them. This is the passage where Jesus speaks most plainly about the whole subject of being born again. And the last thing we heard Nicodemus say was, how can these things be? That is, how can a person be born again? Now, Jesus could have said, if he thought it was true, well, a person can't be. There's nothing you can do to be born again. Uh, this is just the sovereign providence of God to, uh, toward the elect. If, if you happen to be elected, then you'll be born again. If you're not elected, then there's, there's, you might as well forget it. I might as well not be talking to you. I might as well be talking to a rock, because you can't any more repent than a rock can if you're not elect. But Jesus didn't say it that way. Jesus said, well, let me put it this way. Do you remember when Moses put a snake up on the pole? You really remember anyone who'd been bit by a snake and was dying? They could look at that snake, and they'd be healed. Well, it's just like that. The Son of Man is going to be raised up also on a pole. And whoever believes in him will live. Not whoever lives will believe in him. Not whoever God brings to life first will then have the capacity to believe. But rather, whoever believes in him will then, as a result of believing, will live, will have life, will be born again, in other words. So he's answering the question, how can this be? And the answer is, well, it's just by believing. It's just if you believe in the Messiah, the Son of Man, who is to be lifted up, then you will have this new life, this eternal life, which begins with being regenerated, begins with being born again. 
Now, this is, of course, the, the, the consistent teaching throughout Scripture. There's never any place in the Bible that says, if you come to life, then you will believe. But there are many places that say, if you believe, you'll come to life. Uh, and that faith precedes regeneration, which that very fact alone settles the whole debate for anyone who, I would think, doesn't have an agenda in the matter and just would like to see what the Scripture teaches. If you look at John chapter 20 and verse 31, John says, But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That is, I'm trying to bring you to the point of believing because then, if you believe, then you can have life. Believing means as a result of believing, then you will have life through his name. So again, the life comes as a result of believing. The believing doesn't come as a result of having previously, unilaterally been brought to life because you have to be unconditionally elected for that. In Colossians chapter 2, might as well see whether Paul and Jesus are on the same page or not. I think they are. In Colossians chapter 2, Colossians 2.13, Paul says, And you, being dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, that is before, that's what they were, he, uh, they have been dead in their trespasses and, and sins, you, being dead in your trespasses and your uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made a lot, okay, regenerated you, together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Now that last line, having forgiven you, means that happened previous to him bringing you to life. He has brought you to life, having previously forgiven you. How did you get yourself forgiven? We're justified by faith, aren't we? Isn't, uh, isn't that the whole teaching of the scripture, justification by faith? If you have been forgiven, it is because you've had faith. Abraham believed in the Lord, and it was counted to him for righteousness. You have been forgiven, of course, because of your faith, like Abraham was, like David was, like Paul argues everywhere we are. But notice he says that God has brought us uh, alive from the dead. You were dead, but he has made you alive together with him, having, and the word having means having previously, forgiven you of all your trespasses. That means, of course, that transaction of forgiveness took place before the transaction of regeneration. I believe simultaneously, essentially, but, but Paul is saying that the, re the regeneration is the upshot of forgiveness. Because God has forgiven you, because you believed, then he's made you alive again. Anyway, this is, uh, I don't have to go on and on. Wanted to just say, as you look at any scripture in the Bible about regeneration, about coming alive from the dead. In every case, it is said to be the result of faith, not the cause of faith. And so Jesus is the first to bring this point up when he's talking to Nicodemus. How can I be born again? How can I be regenerated? Jesus is going to say, well, it just all depends on whether you're elected or not before you're ever born. Maybe you can be, maybe you can't be. He said, no, anyone who believes in him shall not perish but will have everlasting life. We'll receive this life that comes through regeneration. Anyone who believes in him. That's what Jesus says. Whoever believes in him should not perish. Now, my own understanding is that John is the, is the writer that is not Jesus. Jesus is not speaking beyond this point. That John is giving out commentary based on this conversation he had with Nicodemus in verses 16 through 21. So the fact that the New King James and many translations keep all those verses within the quotation marks as if Jesus is still speaking is an area where the translation I would have a different uh, opinion about that. So Jesus having spoken about whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life, John picks up that thread in verse 16 I think and says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light 
and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. <clears throat> but he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. Now, as I said, there's, there's reasons why I personally think this is John instead of Jesus continuing to speak. Um, the use of the term God so frequently instead of the Father. Uh, none of these verses do make reference to the Father, but they, the, the word God is used again and again. Also, uh, that he speaks about the light in the same way that John did in the prologue of the Gospel a great deal, and in John's epistles. But of course, one could argue that Jesus used those terms here, and John picked it up from him. That's a possibility. Certainly, John was influenced by what he heard Jesus say in these things. But the material in verses 16 through uh, 21, especially uh, 17 through 21, don't seem to be directly relevant to Nicodemus's concerns. Nicodemus was not one of these people who was hating the light. He came to the light. He knew Jesus was something, and so he approached him. Je now, these, these verses talk about people who come to the light because their, their deeds are, are truthful deeds, and then there's people who don't. It's more like a, a universalizing of you know, the choice that people have to make that, that John might be making to his readers, but which Jesus, there wouldn't be a real direct reason for him to say these things to Nicodemus, who had already shown himself to be one who comes to the light. Uh, Jesus could just be talking in the abstract about people who aren't there, who hate the light, but it wouldn't be an essential part of what he's communicating, I think, between himself and Nicodemus, in my opinion. Anyway, whether Jesus said it or John, it's true theology, and so we'll just deal with its contents, rather than worrying over much about who spoke it. Now, John 3.16, of course, is at one time was the best known verse in the Bible. Uh, I say at one time because I think another one has become more well known since in modern times, uh, and especially among unbelievers. And that would be uh, Matthew 7 1. Judge not that you be not judged. Uh, but I think that verse is the most often quoted verse uh, in, in modern times. But uh, John 3.16 used to be the best known verse, and it's a good summary of the Gospel of John and of really the message of the Bible as a whole. It's not always the case that you can find one verse that encapsulates all the main themes of the book, because, of course, John didn't even divide the book into verses, so it's not like he thought, I'm going to come up with one verse that people quote forever as the summary of this thing, but it's just a, it's just a great verse in this respect, because... It talks about the love of God for the world, which is the motivation for everything in, in God's dealings with mankind. That's why he called Abraham. That's why he called Israel out of Egypt. That's why he sent his son, because he cared for the world. And through Abraham's seed, Christ, he would eventually bless all the nations of the world. Every family of the earth will be blessed through Abraham's seed, who is Christ. It's God's love for the whole world that caused him to do this. And therefore he sent his only begotten son. Now that's how the King James and the New King James read. Modern translations don't usually use the term only begotten because it's not really the right translation for the word monogenes. The Greek word monogenes is there instead of only begotten. And in the old days, in 1611, when the King James was translated, Greek scholars thought that monogenes was related to the word genea, or generated or birthed, uh, and mono means only, so they thought only begotten is the meaning of it. However, they now know that monogenes is, has a different uh, etymology, and it has more the meaning of something like unique, not so much only begotten, but unique. Now, essentially it's the same issue, but um, a lot of translations, like I think the NIV uses the phrase one and only son, something like that, the one of a kind son the one and only Son. And we're, we were dealing with the New King James here, so we've still got the King James wording. There's no significant difference, I think, except that if the term did mean only begotten Son, then it has to be taken not absolutely, because, of course, God has begotten us also, the Bible says. We've been born of God. Uh, Peter says, Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So 
we're begotten sons too. In that sense, Jesus is not the only son that God has ever begotten. But he is the unique son. He's not like any other son. He's the one and only son of his kind. And that's what the word monogenes means here. And God did this so that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Perish. What does that mean? God sent Jesus so that people would not have to perish. And those who believe in him will not perish. What does perish mean? Well, the Greek word perish, apolistai, means a number of things. Sometimes it's translated die. Sometimes it's translated destroy. Sometimes it's translated to lose or to be lost. Uh, and sometimes perish. Or, and there's, there's a variety of other meanings. But, for example, when the, when the Bible talks about the lost sheep, that the shepherd goes out and recovers it. The same word is used as perish, the word lost. The, the sheep has perished. When the prodigal, son, my, the prodigal son's father said, my son was lost, but now he's found, the word lost there in the Greek is perish, the same as here. Perish has the idea of loss. It has the idea of being destroyed. Now, is that the fate of people who are not believers? That they are destroyed? That they're merely lost? We have a much more developed theology about the judgment ultimately on sinners. That has come down to us from through the ages, and that is, of course, that uh, they're not really fully destroyed. They're kind of maintained alive forever and ever and ever in a torture chamber called hell. 